It's uh, nice to see such big numbers again. Um, so welcome to Data and Drinks again. Uh, we're here at uh, Xomnia today, and uh, we're hosting an uh, event, or, as you know, about uh, the NG transition and data and uh, machine learning. Uh, we have two uh, very interesting speakers today. Uh, the first one is uh, from Martijn. Uh, he uh, is a consultant at Xomnia at Annexus. And he uh, will talk about uh, how we can plan uh, all the facilities that are needed for the energy transition. And the second speaker of today is uh, Elisa. She works at SimPower, and she's going to talk about, about their uh, software and data machine learning platform, which they use to uh, balance the uh, international electricity market. Um, so super excited to uh, know more about that. Hope you are as well. Um, but before we go into the presentations, I want to uh, tell us a little thing about uh, Xomnia, where we're, uh, about who we are. Um, so we are a uh, artificial intelligence consultancy company, which uh, in essence means that we do uh, projects at different clients throughout the Netherlands. We uh, mostly have technical roles here at Xomnia, uh, for example, machine learning engineers, data engineers, data scientists, uh, but also analytics translators who are between the business and the technical people and data architects. Um, for me, I started here, uh, oh wait, first here. <laughs> um, we have uh, machine learning engineers here at Xomnia as well. So that's uh, where most of the talks are about today. Uh, so we implement machine learning models of clients, for example, by being part of their team. Uh, for example, Martijn is doing this now. Um, and we start new machine learning projects as well. Uh, so a client can come to us and say, hey, we want a new recommender system. And then we have really smart uh, data scientists and machine learning engineers who can make this and bring this to production. Uh, but we also build data and, and, and analytics platforms from scratch. So if they get started, we help them build the architecture, design systems, and implement them, actually. Um, so some of our clients are, uh, you can see at the bottom, uh, for example, Aliander uh, and Annexus, both uh, the net providers, but also uh, commercial uh, companies like Foto von Ziggo or EMA or Albert Heijn, where I work now at, uh, at the client, uh, but also uh, Ocean Cleanup, for example. Uh, we also manage the data infrastructure for them. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, so I started here three years ago as a uh, junior in the development program where we also give trainings uh, to. Um, and I'm now part of the core team, uh, which is now about um, 60 consultants big. And we uh, normally come here on the Fridays for the Friday afternoon drinks and do all kinds of fun things to get our share knowledge and uh, yeah, just have a general good time. So if you're looking for a job or maybe you know someone, we are looking for people. Um, so please reach out to one of our uh, team members here. Um, if everyone can raise their hands, Fruits from Xomnia. <laughs> and you can also recognize us by the sticker. So if you have any more questions, please find us. Or go to our website. You can find uh, lots of stuff there as well. <clears throat> Without further ado, I want to uh, give the word to the first speaker, Martijn. Give, give a big applause, please. Hello, everyone. Glad to see uh, so many faces. Um, let's wait a little bit for the slides. Oh. Good. Again, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Martijn and I'm a machine learning engineer at Xomnia. And uh, yeah, for this topic uh, tonight, uh, I was asked to give a talk about our project at Annexus. Um, so at Annexus, um, yeah, I started as a, a trainee. So I, I followed the uh, machine learning engineer trainee program at Xomnia and I started right away at uh, Annexus, a uh, wonderful company. So, Annexus and the uh, energy transition. Let's first say something about Annexus. Annexus is uh, one of the grid operators that we have in the Netherlands. And um, 
as service areas in the north and the south of the Netherlands. Um, and their main goal is to uh, yeah, build and maintain electricity and gas grids. Uh, um, yeah, so we can uh, heat our houses, uh, turn on our computers, and uh, that's that that kind of things. Um, so um, more about Annexus. Um, Annexus is facing uh, several challenges. Um, so as a grid operator, um, we have defined three different worlds for Annexus. Um, and what we see in the world of yesterday is that the grid was pretty stable. Um, so you had a big producer, like the energy company, providing energy to the grid. And we had consumers consuming energy from this grid. Um, and it was quite balanced. What is happening today is that this dynamic changes. So, for example, your neighbor can be an energy producer now, nowadays as well with uh, installing solar panels or a battery pack. Um, and we see an increasing amount of wind energy. All of these actors within this grid are providing a different dynamic and grid operators need to yeah, account for this. Um, and yeah, really need to take a more proactive, um, uh, yeah, more, do more proactive decision-making than reactive. Um, because yeah, we have a scarcity of resources, money, humans, uh, and we, re we really need to be careful with uh, making a decision. And about making a decision, um, where are we today? We have yeah, two worlds where we can go through. Um, we have this very nice green world and this uh, gray is uh, in the corner world. Um, in this green world, we have a, yeah, a healthy energy system where energy is produced locally and consumed locally. So one, this is very efficient, and two, this is way cheaper and also better maintainable for the future. Uh, where we don't want to be is this in this world where every day everyone just abuses the grid. Uh, it's very unstable, very costly, uh, and also the, uh, the outages uh, that all of this will incur. So going to this green world is um, yeah, somewhat, somewhat the mission of Annexus, um, whereby it facilitates this energy transition. And I will, uh, yeah, tell you a little bit more about what we've done at Annexus uh, as a as a Xomnia. So a little bit more about the context and the challenges. So one news uh, uh, message, one in three streets in the Netherlands must be opened to enable green power. The energy around Eindhoven um, increases enormously and Annexus uh, makes a warning. The Dutch energy grid uh, um, is, is getting to a halt. These are all things you can read in the news that grid operators need to, yeah, need to do something with. The um, main thing that we will look at today are the low voltage grids. So how can we give more insights within this grid and how can we provide information? Okay, what component do we need to replace in the near future, for example? These are all kinds of things that we can combine smart algorithms and data uh, to really give insights to an access and to help them um, yeah, accelerate the energy transition. So within this low voltage grid, um, it's the grid that connects to houses. Uh, what we see there is an uh, increasing amount of solar panels. So consumers will um, yeah, buy solar panel and will produce electricity. And this will yeah, occur, obviously, additional load to this grid. When you see the growth curve of uh, solar panels, you see that uh, yeah, the big, we are in a big uh, ascent. Um, and we see this uh, going off by the end of 2034. For electric vehicles or electric mobility, this just started. So what we see is that um, in 2030, we expect around 2 million electric vehicles in the Netherlands that um, yeah, really electrify the energy required to do mobility. Huh? Before we use gas, gasoline and diesel. Now we use electricity and this electricity needs to come somewhere. And lastly, a big driver is uh, the heat transition. So you all know the company of Van het Gas af. Uh, well, this poses for an excess and uh, additional uh, yeah, challenge because all of these houses need to be heated with uh, electricity or, for example, district heating. 
So these are the axes that uh, change the current energy grid of the indexes. And what we need to do is be more proactive. So when we want to replace a certain component, we, we want to know why. So we want to have some kind of uh, quantification of these trends I showed you. So what does it mean if I see so many electric vehicle charging points? What does it mean on the grid? What cable do I need to replace? Which transformer do you need to replace? Uh, we want to go to some kind of simulation model that quantifies this and uh, allows us to uh, deploy our resources more efficiently. So, more concrete, the thing we've been working on is the Annexus Energy Transition Tool, and this is a simulation program um, that's used to uh, yeah, quantify these trends. So what it does is that uh, it creates local scenarios. So from a starting point, for example, we, we will get uh, 20 gigawatts of uh, solar panels in 2040. We transform that to a local scenario. So what high, what connection is getting a PV installation? So with that out of the way for PV, EV and heat pumps, we go to the second step and say, okay, what does an adoption of a solar panel means for the grid? So we connect a load profile to this. After we, we've done that, so we've quantified the impact of such a component to the grid, uh, we will compute um, and we will do a load flow calculation. And this uh, calculates the load for a specific component within the grid based on the scenario. For now, we will um, focus on this first part. So how do we go from a global scenario, so 10 gigawatts in 2030, to a local scenario. So how do we know this house will have a high probability of adopting a charging point or a heat pump or something? This question um, can be distinguished in two components. First, we want to know when does this adoption occurs? So we have some kind of um, uh, S-curve distribution that says, okay, I have an endpoint in 2030 or 2040, and my adoptions will increase gradually according to this S-curve uh, with a certain adoption probability. The second step in this question is that, okay, which specific connection, so for example, a household, will get this charging point, solar panel or heat pump. And together with these two components, we can make uh, probabilistic scenarios and really go from a global scenario to a local scenario in terms of expected value. So we will go in more in detail in this statistical model. So we use data, we use some kind of model, and we want to output a certain probability of adopting certain technology. Does the business want a statistic model? No. <laughs> they want, uh, and this is fairly technical still, they want adoption probabilities of solar panels, EV charging points, and heat pumps on a household level based on logic, uh, logical and explainable features. So very concrete, uh, my neighbor has a 60% uh, percent chance of adopting a heat pump in the next 20 years. This is what they want. With this, they can transform this global scenario to a local scenario and really uh, yeah, simulate what this happens or what this means for this grid. So we have translated this in three different steps. Uh, first, we're gonna explore the data that we've used for this question. Uh, we go a little bit into the modeling part that we've done, and we will show you the end result on, okay, what, what are these adoption probabilities? How do they look like? And what are the differences, for example? So starting with the labels. Um, the labels are, yeah, quite fake, for example. For PV, they're quite straightforward. So there's a registration um, in the Netherlands that consumers need to register their installation so they can get a uh, tax return. And I think all of the Dutch people will do this. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this source is quite accurate. Um, for the other two sources, it's more difficult. So this is behind this uh, meter of NXS and behind this meter, it's very difficult to see what a co consumer does. So a heat pump maybe also can be like a pool, for example. It, it, it asks a lot of energy um, during specific moments in time. 
we've used some business rules to make our labels. So what connection do we think has a uh, resonance charging point and what connection do we think has a uh, heat pump? Um, this was quite difficult, but we yeah, managed to do this for a uh, yeah, set in this grid. Another problem with the last two categories is that they're sparse. So the current adoptions of public charging points and heat pumps is quite low making it the, the theoretical problem for us quite yeah, difficult to solve. But we will see what uh, we can do. So from the labels to the features, um, we frame this problem as a uh, yeah, supervised uh, classification problem. And we now need some logical features to, uh, yeah, to see if we can find some relations. So for now, I, I've uh, introduced four different sources. There are much more, but uh, yeah, I only got, can talk for an half an hour. So uh, you will uh, have this. Um, we will use some uh, social demographic data. So for example, what we've seen is that when we plot the income against the adoption probability of a solar panel, you see a positive relation uh, occurring um, where, yeah, the higher the income, the higher the probability of uh, adopting such an installation. And you see a strange effect happening when the income becomes over a specific uh, limit. Um, we have more of these type of relations within uh, <clears throat> this social demographic data. So, for example, um, you can see the, the a certain urban index, and this is uh, the number of households per square per square kilometer, for example, and this could potentially say something about adopting a public charging point. Because there, yeah, of course, there need to be space. I think there are much more public charging points um, in some kind of outskirt uh, neighborhood than in Amsterdam, um, and this is only residential. Sorry, residential, not public. Um, we also have ALAT. ALAT is a, a knowledge institute in the Netherlands that provides information on uh, e-mobility. So, for example, they provide an outlook of uh, residential EV charging points on a neighborhood level. Unfortunately, it is, not, it, it is on a neighborhood level, otherwise we could use this source. Uh, but, it also, but we want to have it on a connection level because we want to assign the specific load of this uh, residential charger to a specific cable. And then when you do this analysis on a neighborhood level, um, yeah, it is too big. But we can use it as features, for example, for the number of electric vehicles and really point out the neighborhoods that are likely to adopt uh, electric charging points. We also use the energy potential index. So this is a source published by the CBS as well. And this gives insights in the amount of energy saving potential there is within the neighborhood. So for example, um, um, this day, so for example, when this index is high, you could save a lot of energy within this area. Um, and it negatively correlates with, for example, the building year of a property. The older the property, the higher the index, for example. And this could give some kind of relation in adopting a heat pump, but because for a heat pump, you need a, a insulation value that's quite high. And of course, insulating your house, you require a large investment. Um, and of course, yeah, a specific group in the Netherlands will do this and yeah, can do this. And lastly, we use Bach. This is um, um, a resource that uh, contain, which contains properties, all of the properties of the Netherlands that, uh, for example, we have service area, building year, and etc. So with these several sources, we do some transformations. Um, we remove outliers, um, and of course, we impute where possible and remove variables if uh, we have missing values. Um, for example, the CBS data sets are quite, uh, yeah, um, the, we, we had quite some issues with data quality. Um, yeah, and yeah, you really need to uh, work your way through this to uh, yeah, really have a accurate and neat feature set for this. We scaled our numerical variables and we encoded our categorical variables to really uh, yeah, start with this feature set and uh, split our data sets in uh, yeah, the, 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 the normal splits. For the modeling approach, um, so now we have features, we have labels, 
uh, we have used a XA boost model after some iterative, iterative process of uh, experimenting with different models. Um, as I said in the beginning, we're really focused on this feature part. So uh, I think the modeling part was quite small, um, but the most important thing for us was that we could explain why the model is doing certain things um, for, yeah, of course, the domain experts in uh, adopting our method. So with this model, um, we uh, obviously got, got some results. So for solar panels, um, predicting this adoption uh, and providing this adoption probability gave an F1 score of 0.7. Um, so this is okay-ish, uh, but you have to bear in mind that most of the features that we've used are on postal code level. So for example, you have the average income on a postal code and you try to predict what adoption uh, probability is on a household level. So there's a difference in, in uh, aggregation and it makes it hard to predict correctly. When we look at uh, residential charging points, um, yeah, you see that predicting a positive label is even more difficult as there is so little current adoptions in the Netherlands. Um, so results were not that good, um, but good enough for Nexus to sign off on and really start collecting more data and improving up on the model. And I think this is for, for now the proper approach. Um, for heat pumps, um, yeah, the results for the positive labels were a little bit worse. Um, yeah, it's very difficult for us to see where is this heat pump. And with that many current adoptions, it's very hard for a model to learn this uh, correct relation with features on a different abstraction level. Um, but we saw some interesting uh, adoption probabilities and we really want to go into, okay, what does the model give, give us? So well, when we look at um, explaining this model, we have used a uh, shape, value, shape values for that. Um, so a brief explanation. Uh, on the x-axis, you see the impact on the model's output. Um, so left is negative, so there's a negative impact on the output for a feature. And you see the color is uh, a high or a low feature value, where red is high, blue is low. So for example, some interesting finding is that uh, when we look at label vermogen, so this is the current adoptions of solar panels. When we look at the model for EV charging points, we see that there's a positive relation. So having a solar installation uh, positively correlates to adopting or having a high adoption probability of a residential charging points. This could make sense, and we verified this relation and this assumption with the domain experts of Alexis. Furthermore, we see also a positive relation of VOZ value, so the value of the property with adopting a um, residential charging point. Um, and this obviously could make sense if uh, we have a very high value a property, there's probably a garden and probably a place for a residential charging point. Um, so that could make, make sense as well. The important thing is, is that these relations may change over time. So they can be influenced by, for example, subsidies, um, in, in, impacted by, for example, neighbor, new neighborhoods and things like this. So we need to update this regularly and really yeah, see what's now important for this model to, uh, yeah, to push through production. Last, about this, uh, about the final results. So currently, uh, the model provided us with adoption probabilities on a uh, connection level. And they're displayed on the right. So this is the next service area. And you see some differences. So obviously, we see differences. And that may come to the average VOZ uh, value or the average um, household size, for example. And Remember, we wanted to go from a global scenario to a local scenario. So let's see if we can validate our approach. So going from this global scenario to a local scenario, we want um, to compute the relative probability. So for example, we have X and X is a specific household. We divide the pro adoption probability of a residential charging point by the sum of all of the probabilities, and we multiply the entire scenario with this. So for example, we have the, the entire scenario are, for example, 100,000 charging points in the service area of an X, we will get the expected value at this specific location. 
In this way, we can go from this global scenario to a local scenario, and we can compare these figures with the data from ALAT. I mentioned this uh, in the beginning, ALAT provides these predictions on a neighborhood level. Um, they are not much of value for ANET, but can be used to validate our approach. So what you can see is that um, the relatively adoption, the relative adoptions really indicate the hotspots quite well. Of course, there are some differences. Um, yeah, and yeah, of course, with an approach that we've taken or is possible, there will be some differences. But we really like what we've seen and uh, we continue with this approach. So with these new um, adoption probabilities, ANET, so the tool that we were developing, can more accurately predict where these adoptions will take place, what load will they have, and what uh, uh, future congestion will they contribute to. Uh, furthermore, this information can then subsequently be used to uh, yeah, deploy, deploy the resources of actions more efficiently. So lastly, um, this is output of ANET. So this is, gives really a lot of insights in what, where are resources, which resources are overloaded, uh, and by how much. So for example, we have some X distance of cable that's overloaded. We have so many transformers that are overloaded by the scenario that we have uh, calculated. And we can see this on a very detailed level. So for example, we see here the city of Eindhoven. Uh, we have computed a certain global scenario with this. We've used our adoption probabilities to distribute the load to specific households. And we see that there are some stations that are overloaded some distance of cables are overloaded. And this information can be used to um, help Inexus with planning their resource replacement or uh, asset replacements more efficiently. Thank you for your attention. I think it was quite a mouthful. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, how they made it in the beginning now, because they just consider that area have a lot of industrial companies, mm -hmm. then they just, uh, so they just uh, build the stations. Yeah, so for example, Eindhoven is, uh, oh yeah. So how does it come that Eindhoven is so overloaded? Yeah, good question. Um, indeed, most of the assets of an access are, for example, 30 years old or 20 years old. So cable goes in the ground for 40 years, 40 years. Yeah. We, 40 years ago, we didn't know what kind of load we could expect. And that's why we're doing these kinds of efforts. Um, but there was no option of solar panels or no option of electric charging points. So for that while ago, um, it was very difficult to uh, define the size of, for example, a cable. Um, and then in, Yeet, in Eindhoven, there's a lot of industrial uh, load coming from all of the campuses and industrial uh, in industrial uh, complexes. Um, so I think it's just, yeah, an estimation and compared with the age of the assets uh, where it will result in high overload percentages. Because I, I, two days ago, I had a, I was talking with a guy who worked with Allianz for the, for the cable. Hmm? Yeah, they were, yeah, now operate a lot around the city of Amsterdam. And so I'm asking, uh, have you also bring along the KBN together? Because they are going to, they also will do cut cable. Yeah. yeah you're not operating and you do for your own company, but uh, the KBN is now yeah. And then that's operation. So I was, for this, need to from the city of Amsterdam be able to look at it. That means uh, how the, in the potential, you now not ready to, but uh, you still can, yeah, you, 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 you alliance to give her some, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you give this additional service to KVN to put them, say, we now the first four years, we only do it. Why not do it together now? Yeah, yeah. So I think this we really need to, to think about it. Mm -hmm. I do this so much overlapping. Yeah. There's a lot of overconsumption. Yeah. Just to build up the very good point. Yeah. yeah, very good point. Yeah, indeed. I think it's a little bit beyond the scope of yeah. this one, this uh, application, yeah. but uh, yeah, very good point. Very nice. 
Yeah, I think this is the starting point to need. Yeah, go go ahead. Uh, uh, how do you define that the area is overloaded? I mean, uh, you do not define, you have just the data that somebody gave you, but what, what is the definition of the overloaded node? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so on every asset or... Oh, damn it. <laughs> so what is the definition of overloading? Um, good question. So every asset um, within the, uh, yeah, from an access has like a capacity when the computed scenario or simulated scenario goes over this capacity, an item is overloaded. Of course, there are different stages in overloading because we can yeah, uh, do several things to uh, dump the, 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 the profile. Um, but for now, for us, it's like 50, if, if it comes above 50%, it's overloaded and it becomes spread. So there's about similar scenarios. Uh, but uh, for you don't have anything for real time things like uh, right now this particular node uh, is overloaded but still not over. No, no. So this tool we we only use for like more mid to long term predictions. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a question about the mid to long term predictions. I was wondering how your relation with features like yeah, like you said, income, many things. Did you know that? Like yeah, good question indeed, because sometimes these things change and we are comparing with the adoptions we see now. Um, yeah, so for example, what we've did, we've checked them, for example, for 2012 and now and see what the differences are in, for example, income or um, uh, property value and things like this. Um, the thing was, we would like to use these older features for our problem, but the data quality was just not good enough. Um, so we, we just kept at the current day features and use them to see if we find a relation now. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that you want to use these feature values from before to this prediction, but data quality did not uh, yeah, allow us to. <laughs> Yeah, and all, yeah, indeed. And uh, then using this probability for the connections that don't have an adoption yet. Yeah. Yeah, one question on why is Nexus focused on the per connection, not per neighborhood? Because I think all supply and all things is more than a neighborhood. So yeah. So the question is why does Nexus focus on the, the connection level, so household connection level? Um, so indeed, we've seen that. Um, um, most of the lower voltage cables are similar for, for example, post postal code area, so a base SS area. Um, so we, we have aggregated to this level so, for some times, um, but we did find that neighborhood level was too large. So we had too many assets within one neighborhood that we couldn't say, okay, this load will go to this asset within this neighborhood and the other load will go to another asset in this neighborhood. Um, so yeah, it's really a, 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 a aggregation level and really want to see, okay, I want to see the overload percentage of this asset. Yeah. Um, about uh, assets, um, I'd like to get back to the definition of uh, whether we have this asset or that asset. And you mentioned that you used some business rules to define whether there are some heat, uh, heat pumps and so on. Can you please give some examples of such business rules. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for example, for heat pump, uh, it was a little bit more easier. Um, so for example, we just sketch out every scenario a consumer can go through when adopting a heat pump. So, or you have a neighborhood or a new, newly built house with a heat pump already, but we have information on this. Um, but we also have, um, for example, a house that has a normal gas heated uh, environment and goes to a heat pump so you see the gas decretion and you see energy decreasing or energy increasing um, and we have defined how many energy should increase if we want to heat this house with a heat pump and of course the gas needs to decrease to, to zero if there's an all-electric heat pump um, yeah with these kind of business rules we have inferred the current labels
maybe the last question. Yeah, let's go for the last question, Phil. I was thinking, uh, I was wondering about the feature selection. I saw some interesting features. I was wondering how we come up with these. Process, uh, yeah, yeah good, good question. Um, we've done it uh, iteratively, um, but together with the business. Um, so, for example, a nice one is, for example, the percentage of favorite voters. Uh, and probably it's not because of their green image, but because of text. <laughs> um, but together with the business, we sat down and said, okay, could this potentially say something about adopting a heat pump? Um, and then, of course, also with the um, yeah, relating increase or decrease in performance. So it was more a yeah, peer to peer and uh, iterative uh, process. Yeah, yes. thank you so much. Yes, you too. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Give me a great applause. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Can I get your attention, please? If everyone can come back to the main hall. <laughs> Ik denk dat ze eigenlijk iedereen daar nog kunnen kijken. Yes. We are still having some spots here at the front if you'd like. If you like to sit down, you have a good view. <laughs> uh, still a couple of more here. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed uh, your short break and got a drink. Uh, we're about to start with the second speaker of tonight. I think we still have one or two chairs here at the front. So if everyone has found a spot, then we uh, can continue. Uh, so our second speaker, speaker of the night is uh, Elissa from SimPower. And uh, she already gave me some spoilers, but not all of them. So I'm super curious about what SimPower does. Something with uh, the renewable electricity transition and uh, how their software helps international networks to, uh, yeah, to work together. So give a big applause for Elissa. Thank you, and yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time for this uh, second talk of this uh, meetup, which I have the pleasure to present to you. Indeed, I'm Elissa, and I am working at SimPower, and at SimPower we are empowering renewable electricity grids, and we're mainly doing that with flexibility. I'm going to tell you all about that, but of course we also do that with AI, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Before I dive into details very quickly about me, I am currently not working at Somnia, so at the host of tonight, but I am working at SimPower. I am the data team lead at SimPower since a year, and I am also a big sustainability enthusiast, which is a very good match, actually, of course, for the topic. Graduated as an econometrician in Maastricht in 2016, had a career in software and data engineering, of which also one year here at Somnia as actually the second big data engineer trainee of the traineeship that they offer here. It was a really, really fun and good year and always good to be back. Um, then I moved my career basically into energy and I worked a few years for a company that um, provided and still provides the smart thermostat tone. I think there are some in this office, but maybe you know the smart thermostat tone and the, uh, yeah, the smart energy advice it gives you to heat and uh, power your house. And yeah, then we arrive at where I'm at now, SimPower Data Team Lead. So that's all about me. And then it's uh, time now to dive into the content of the talk. I always like to show this short video because it gives you in one and a half minutes a little bit of an idea what I'm going to talk about before I tell you a bit more in depth the whole story. So let's go and listen to actually my boss, SimPower was founded in 2015 in Estonia with the goal of accelerating the energy transition. Six years later, we now have more than 60 people working in six different countries. We unlock flexibility, mostly from commercial and industrial customers, such as paper mills, greenhouses, data centers, and cold storage facilities. The energy system of the future is becoming more and more electric. Heat pumps and electric cars are replacing gas boilers and gasoline cars, and more and more local providers of sustainable energy are emerging. This makes it more difficult to keep the supply and demand of electricity in balance, posing new challenges for electricity grid operators. Flexibility is part of the solution to these challenges. SimPower looks for this flexibility in existing processes at our commercial and industrial customers. We then connect these flexible devices to our software platform. 
That allows us to have control over the energy use of the processes or installations. We pool processes like these together from our different customers and offer them as a single pool to an electricity grid operator like Tenet. And this helps Tenet to keep the electricity system in balance. SimPower is active in the Netherlands, Sweden, Finland and Norway. And we will soon go live in Israel, Denmark, Spain and Greece. We want to expand to many more countries in the coming years and also deliver new services in the countries where we are now. This will help us to achieve our goal of enabling the transition to a fully renewable energy system. SimPower, together towards a smarter energy future. So I hope it was a bit like uh, you could hear it all, but what you got from this video probably is that basically we're introducing similar problems like Martijn just introduced to us. So we have the grid that is needs to be in balance. There are challenges coming to us, like much more electrification and much more crowdedness on the grid. And we need to do stuff to make this basically future proof, right? Um, however, let me make a bridge with the talk we just heard from Martijn. So whereas the grid operators like Inexis, they are looking a little bit more like several years into the future and how they can already plan to make basically their local infrastructure ready for the future. SimPower plays a very different game. We actually look at the more, let's say the global level, in this case, actually at the country level. And we try to solve already certain problems occurring now, almost like real time. And with that, I really mean real time. And I'm going to explain you how we do that. Well, so what is needed as well for a successful transition to a renewable grid, there needs to be flexibility on the grid. And we're needing, in order to provide that, data and AI to help basically provide this flexibility. So the rest of my talk will basically be, first of all, about explaining you what this flexibility is, how it helps, and how it works. And then, once we understand that together, I will tell you more about the role of data and AI is. What do we mean with flexibility? Let's take a step back together and understand, okay, we've heard it now, right? Balancing of supply and demand, that's one of the big, big challenges in the future for a well, future-proof grid. Um, and especially if we want to make it a climate-proof grid in the future. On the supply side, we see more renewables. So that comes with certain challenges on the demand side, we see much more electrification, like Martijn also said. Uh, basically, gas consuming devices are replaced by ele electric devices. And we see that we start driving in electric cars and whatnot. And also at the industrial level, we see more and more electrification. So this causes basically more volatility, less predictability, and more congestion at certain moments. How does this work at basically um, a global at a country level, let's say, at the electricity markets. Basically, continuously from the long term, going into the intraday, even into the real time moment, the electricity markets try to prepare supply and demand to be uh, equal to each other. So there's all kinds of auctions and markets that try to match supply and demand, predicting closer and closer to the near future. And we do this because if supply and demand are not basically equal, we get all kinds of problems. And one of the problems is that the frequency might not be sustained at 50 Hertz, which is one of the requirements to have a reliable working grid. Um, so in the case that we tried really hard to predict supply and demand and match it up, but still, in the end, now, real time, the frequency is not maintained at 50 hertz because supply and demand are out of balance. Then we need balancing services, which are kind of markets, auctions that take care of that, to counter the imbalance. Because a grid that is out of balance doesn't work properly. These balancing markets work as follows. So you see here in this graph that 
at the moment that we have suddenly a frequency drop, then there is basically balanced reserves in place, primary, secondary, tertiary. So over time, there is different mechanisms in place that will, um, will start to act in order to get this frequency back up to 50 hertz. Or if in case of a frequency peak, back down to 50 hertz can also be the case. And you see some yeah, letter abbreviations over there, short abbreviations. Don't pay attention too much to them, but just remember like there is different um, mechanisms that have a primary, secondary, tertiary reaction over time. So it's really about when do they react? How much time do they have to react to counter the imbalance? And for instance, in the Nordic countries like Finland, Sweden, Norway, we have um, yeah, what we call FFR, which stands for fast frequency reserve and a few other of these mechanisms that uh, basically activate um, in the case of certain frequency deviations and need to react with a certain speed. So there is different mechanism and what differs is uh, how much they balance again and how fast they balance again. Now, if you want to participate in such programs, in such um, mechanisms, then you need to as a party that wants to participate there, make a bid often a day ahead and say, listen, tomorrow, in case of a frequency uh, imbalance, I would be able to have some flexible availability, some flexible power, like a lot of megawatts that I can suddenly switch on or off to counter this imbalance, this, this imbalance of supply and demand. And by the way, for each megawatt that I make available tomorrow, at this hour, I want this price. And this basically is an auction. So all the parties involved, they make their bids and the transmission system operator. So that's not like the in excess of uh, the countries, but it's actually in the Netherlands, like the tenants, the transmission system operators, they, um, they make these auctions and they get all the parties that can counter these frequency imbalances together. And they choose the one that offer the cheapest uh, flexible availability. Now you might be thinking, hey, this problem is, okay, it's definitely a problem of the future. It's already happening now. This is not like completely new and it is actually true. So um, there is already a mechanism like this in place, but traditionally it's, it's actually just the power plants via the uh, energy suppliers that would counter these imbalances real time by basically the power plant would just increase or decrease their production for a while until the imbalance is over. But this is basically not enough. And given the challenges we see on the grid, we think that there is actually more we can do. What is that? There is actually untapped flexibility on the demand and supply side, apart from these power plants, that we can still use to make these uh, imbalance counteracts. And we call that distributed flexibility because it's not like these um, single, very big power plants, but it's more like the smaller things like greenhouses, a float of, of like a batch of electric cars, a huge boiler, these kind of highly electricity consuming um, devices could also be used to counteract these frequency imbalances. But how are they going to do that? Um, they need, of course, in the first place, to be allowed to participate on this uh, auction, this market that the TSO hosts to um, yeah, basically participate in these programs that counter imbalances. And just by themselves, they're maybe a little bit too small to, act, to participate uh, alone. So if we could aggregate a few of them, they could make a fair offer to the TSO for the, with their availability to counter these imbalances. And yeah, the things that they probably uh, installed capacity is too small, like I said, or it's like lack of know-how. How do these markets work? How can I make a bid? How can I even react in time if that's required? What technology is needed to make this happen so real time? Because once there is a frequency drop, you need to often act quite fast. So how am I going to do that? And all these things make it quite hard to actually for this, this kind of distributed flexible asset to participate. But Luckily, the European Parliament stimulates that we start thinking about these flexible assets. Already a few years ago, they 
made a statement that this is the direction to going forward. And actually also looking from already a sustainability perspective, um, it's very interesting because, well, first of all, as long as these power plants exist, and this is actually a quite a tricky one to understand, but once you get it, you probably think, whoa, that's actually quite smart. Once these power plants exist that still burn some fossil fuels, it would be quite nice if they can get, you know, the most energy out of each gram of fossil fuel that we still burn until we are fully renewable, right? And currently the power plants cannot uh, operate at their most efficient full production capacity because they need to keep a bit of a buffer for acting against uh, frequency imbalances. However, if they don't need to do that anymore, but the flexible assets do it instead, these, um, yeah, basically they could operate at way more efficient levels, full capacity, and we get, while they still exist, way more energy for each gram of fossil fuel we burn. So that's basically a direct effect that we have. Energy suppliers, the, the traditional ones, can um, operate while they still need to with their power plants efficient, more efficient. Um, and the indirect effects you can probably imagine, like we don't need to curtail solar power anymore, or uh, we can basically um, limit under and overproduction if these flexible assets can counter the uh, grid imbalances instead, basically by just switching off a device for a few seconds. So, hmm, wait, this is not exactly what I wanted first, this slide first. So, SimPower is doing this. We are an independent aggregator of these flexible assets. We help industrial parties. Uh, yeah, we're actually working with more than 200 commercial industrial businesses across several countries. You see the ones in blue. So Norway, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, and Israel, they're in the bottom, currently live. We help hundreds of industrial customers, our customers, to basically bid their flexible assets as an aggregate to these markets to operate basically and, and counter uh, frequency imbalances. And we are soon to be live in the countries that are in green. So we are in Europe, actually the biggest independent aggregator currently existing. Going back to my previous slide, um, we do that with a team of 100 people right now of 35 nationalities. You can imagine we're a bit all over Europe, different offices in different countries. And we manage over one gigawatt of flexible distributed assets. So to SimPower, there's like in total, if they would all be fully operating on consuming energy, we would have one gigawatt uh, that we can actually control. I already mentioned it, like what are the kind of assets and devices that can participate? Lights in greenhouses, for instance, or big, um, big machines in paper um, factories, paper industry, maybe like big um, wastewater devices that can just switch off for a bit and then just, uh, yeah, recycle the wastewater a few minutes later, or even big buildings, big boilers, big heat pumps, that kind of stuff. So this sets a bit the context, I hope, to understand what SimPower does, because when I tell it to yeah, basically people for the first time in a few sentences, it's pretty hard to grasp. But I hope that with like the last 10 minutes, I got a bit of a, I got you a bit of a feeling what it actually is about. So what do data and AI do in this flexibility service providing, right? Um, we know now how it works, but how do we actually do it? SimPower's platform that makes basically these connections to all these flexible assets at our 200 customers needs to operate with hardware, software, and data. Let's see how that works. So on the one side, we have the flexible assets. And in order to unlock their flexibility, we need to connect to them with hardware. And this hardware is controlling them, but is also collecting the data necessary to make these real-time um, operations. This data is gathered, both historically and real-time. And from the historic data, we can make forecasts for the day ahead or even a few days ahead for which we need to make these 
um, bits on these markers that I just told you about. And as soon as then we, we as the aggregator are accepted as the winning bit on these markets, and we are actually requested to make an activation, we need to activate the flexibility. So we need to process real time from the TSO a signal, hey, the frequency is off, you need to activate so many megawatts now, and we need to make sure that actually the access we are connected to are doing that and are actually turning off, or in some cases, turning on. So for the unlocking part, so I'm talking here about the, the green box, there it's all a little bit about hardware. So we basically have our own uh, developed hardware. We call them controllers. It's like little boxes that we connect to these use assets at the customer. And they can basically switch on and off this device if needed, and also um, measure the, the metering, that's basically the, the electricity use of these assets over time and um, yeah, sends them to our software platform so that we have the historical data of these devices. Now, I want to zoom in together with you on a problem that the data team at SimPower is caring about and has to provide for. So basically, in SimPower, we have a team. Um, they have a name that doesn't say much to you, but let's call them the bidding team. That's not the data team, but it's a group of people, a group of operational domain experts in each country that need to bid on these markets. And in order to bid on these markets, they need to have good inputs. Namely, they need to know, well, they have the historic availability. We can provide it in nice graphs. For And you can imagine all these 200 customers have many resources. So you're already thinking about at least hundreds or even thousands um, resources that we need to look at. And we need to look at them aggregatedly knowing what is the historic availability and how does that translate into tomorrow's or even more days ahead, the future availability. Because if they know that, they can make the bids and basically do that in such a way that we can actually also meet our activation requirements as soon as we are asked to make an activation on a particular uh, hour or day. What are the AI challenges for the data team in this process? Well, you can imagine that making these bits and especially the forecasts that go, well, that make up these bits, it's actually about knowing how much flexible power, how much controllable power you have available at any time tomorrow or even more days ahead in the future at each hour or um, maybe even a shorter amount of uh, time. On the other hand, if you want to make a bid to the flexible markets, you also need to put a good price on that. Otherwise, you're not even in the game. You're not even accepted as one of the people who uh, gets the money for basically activating when there's a frequency imbalance. And there is these different markets that have different requirements, like when do they react for which size of frequency imbalance, but also how fast do they need to react. And there can actually be a bit of an optimization strategy between the different markets on which market am I going to bid, which resource, which customer. So these three basically make up the equation of basically the forecasting and optimization challenges. But that would be looking at it from a very purely data science perspective. I mean, you can probably most people in the room here have some kind of a data background, I can imagine like, okay, I'm going to make a forecast model for these prices and the availability of each resources. And maybe I'm going to smartly combine all these forecasts of these resources. And then maybe I can make an optimization algorithm over these different markets where I should bid what. But there is also next to that theoretical classical data science problems, a ton of operational data problems. So how do we deal with that we are operating in several countries, uh, already five and soon hopefully 12 even by the end of next year. Um, how do we make sure that the data inputs and outputs are well correctly configured and gathered? How do we make sure that certain customers who are not used to op operating so automatically and software driven and they suddenly have some unavailability last moment, how do we make sure that these predictions take care of that uh, basically more manual phone calls of customers saying like, no, tomorrow I am not available. Um, and last, we have a growing portfolio. When I gave this talk, um, 
a few months ago, I was not telling that we were managing one gigawatt. I was actually saying that we were managing a little bit over 500 megawatt. So we almost doubled our portfolio in, let's say, less than a year. Um, how do we make sure these forecasts can deal with that continuous growth of our portfolio? And just to give an uh, example, like the kind of assets that we're dealing with, they're all very different. Like these different devices, they behave differently. How do we make good forecasts for them? Also looking at the time, I think I need to... It's okay. 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 It's okay. I will talk. <laughs> I will talk further. No worries. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this, so I can talk more. Um, but no, no, no worries. I'm, I'm getting to my uh, final two slides. Um, so imagine that, yeah, we need to forecast all these kind of signals, hundreds, even thousands of them, basically in parallel, aggregate them, and then give them to this team that makes the bits and uh, do some magic with that. What does it take? Well, the data team starts with the data ingestion from the historic availability. So we take historic controllable power from all of these devices that we've measured. And we also take external sources, pretty similar to how Martijn just explained. Um, weather data, maybe some pricing data, that kind of stuff comes also in these models. Then we prepare the data. So we clean the data, we make features of the data, similar to the process like Martijn also explained about how to build a machine learning model for this. Then for each resource, we make a separate machine learning model training and we predict with it. And that is then aggregated, combining these individual forecasts of all resources into the basic aggregation level that is required. So for instance, at the country level, or even in some countries, we have a few areas, like bigger areas within the country where you need to aggregate the forecast for. And we apply some post-processing rules, like some qualification rules, maybe with the transmission system operator, we have an agreement that we cannot bid more than this or not less than that. And all this is happening on our data platform. Now I can also talk about this for another hour, but I don't think I can. <laughs> but this, we're using Databricks um, because starting out with a very small team, only two people a year ago, we needed to hit the ground running and Typically, platforms like these help you with that because they take care of the more technical, nitty-gritty um, maintenance details for you. And this platform provides us with basically the data storage, model training environment, but also uh, the nice experimentation uh, yeah, for the models and basically hosting that in production and putting, making sure that it's reliable every day for our um, bidding team available. And that's also then the fifth and last point of this pipeline, because once these forecasts aggregatedly are available, there is still human intelligence. Again, because customers could call and say like, no, wait a second, we're actually not available, reduce it by two megawatt or something like this, or simply because we see domain expert. Um, oh, it's fine again. No worries. Um, <laughs> sorry? No. Oh. <laughs> anyways, anyways, <laughs> bear with me, people. Um, so yeah, basically this bidding team, they review the forecast and apply some last minute domain knowledge to make sure that it's really ready to be sent to these markets. So let me conclude with that. So Simpa, what do I want you to remember? There is a lot of distributed flexibility available at big commercial industrial sites that we can tap on and make the grid now read time already in balance, and this will help the transition to more and more sustainable grids. And of course, we're going to use heaps of data and AI and software for that. But with a little bit of human intelligence touch at the end. And I think that will remain for a bit and we will see what the future will bring. Thank you. <laughs> And we are also hiring. So <laughs> yes. Um, now this is a oh, well, this is a brilliant slide to take the questions from. Um, of course, questions. Oh, that's many hands. Um, maybe so that I don't have you just yeah, you choose. I will answer the questions. <laughs> 
great talk, really, really good project. Thanks. Um, you spoke about imbalances, and I get how this works when you have too much supply uh, of energy. Uh, does it also work if you have too little supply? Like, how, how would that work? Yeah, good question. So the question is, um, when we have an imbalance, it could be there is too much supply, and can it also be that there is too little supply, right? Like the 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 the, the weights are the other way around, and that can definitely happen. Um, actually, there are um, like these mechanisms that I showed you, like these primary, secondary, tertiary uh, markets that you can participate on. They are there for the up direction and for the down direction, and we are active on both. Uh, Simpower, so we have both assets that, yeah, are production assets that we can turn off, and we also have uh, consuming assets that we can turn also on. <laughs> on off. No, it's, it's also you turn them on, but <laughs> off. But it's like you turn off the production or you turn off the consumption, right? So um, that's how it works. Yeah. Um, how often do you have to retrain? A great philosophical question. How often do we retrain the models? So, I mean, right now our pipeline literally retrains every day. And why is that? Because we very often have new assets. So we basically want to have a setup where basically as soon as a new asset comes in, there's no kind of manual or semi-automated process to still kick off a model training. Um, would there be other ways? Definitely, maybe it's not necessary for each and every resource to train every day. Um, but this was for us a very good starting point and still seems a robust setup because it also allows for all kinds of operational uh, aspects that are dealt with nicely. Good question. Uh, also a good question. So how long do we need to turn an asset off? How long do we provide this flexibility? It depends actually per market program that I introduced to you. So certain of them, it is really a matter of seconds up to minutes, but sometimes it can also be a bit longer, like 15 minutes or even a bit longer. And we are active on these different um, programs. So again, like depending on the program, the requirements are different and it could be that you need to be activated for a bit longer, but, uh, Often not that long. Yes, of course, this is a really good question. What's in it for the parties that basically are our customers and offer the flexibility? Well, we share, we share the profit. That's what we do. So um, basically our proposition is really cool. We go to this industrial customers with, um, no, they have pretty high energy bills, right? Because they have huge assets that often consume a lot of energy. So their energy bills are typically high. We go to them and we say, listen, if you work together with us, you can earn a bit of this energy bill back. Basically, because we just by, you know, working together with us and allowing us to sell your flexibility, you can actually get a share of that profit and, well, it's basically a win-win situation. We make their energy bills lower because they basically get back part by act, act, participating on these markets. And yeah, Simpower in return, of course, for the service also gets uh, a bit. Um, so I think your customers are mainly big industrial companies, that kind of stuff. Could you scale something like this to like a couple of million electric vehicles? So the question is if we can also scale something like this to some, yeah, for instance, uh, a float of electrical vehicles. And the question is, yes, that we can do that. We actually already have a customer or had a customer, like not exactly sure, but we've worked with parties that have indeed uh, electrical vehicles and basically the, the batch of electrical vehicles makes it uh, enough capacity to be interesting to, uh, to work with something like this. Um, yeah, so the, that's, the, that's the answer. <laughs> I mean, more like individually, you know, residential electric vehicles. Ah. Person, but if you do that a couple million times. Yeah. So um, does it also extend to, well, basically a residential proposition? Like, and, and, and uh, so that is a very interesting question. Um, I think theoretically it's possible, but from the basically the hardware and the, 
uh, the business proposition perspective, it's less interesting because you can imagine that you share this pie of profit on this market with then who basically thousands of people with an electrical car. Then it's not so interesting anymore to, yeah, to deal with operational challenges and all the overhead that comes with uh, doing something like this. So theoretically, yes. Practically, we don't see it happening and we also don't have customers like this. So we really focus on the, yeah, the bigger customers, industrial uh, customers. Makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I can see this works extremely well within a country, but do you get involved at all with energy uh, sales and marketing between countries? So the question is, if we also deal with basically international um, problems on, um, yeah, basically grid, grid uh, imbalances and to be really honest i'm not exactly sure i'm <laughs> so I, i'm afraid i can't answer that question honestly because i would need to make up an answer um there's definitely if you're interested in this and you want to know the answer get in touch with me and i can definitely connect you to a colleague who knows this answer <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that we have a lot of time period and you trying to discuss them separately and then aggregate why actually don't you aggregate them before and then predict the uh, aggregate? Thanks for the question. I think it's a really nice, uh, yeah, modeling uh, question you asked. So the question is, why do we uh, forecast per resource and then aggregate instead of aggregating first and then yeah, forecasting the, the aggregation, the aggregate? And of course it's possible. Uh, both are valid modeling approaches, but especially dealing with the challenges of continuously new customers and resources growing so rapidly. Basically, the, the aggregate signal is in no way really representative for what's coming in the future. So basically trading on the aggregate signal um, for a country, it changes all the time because we're continuously adding customers. So of course there is modeling techniques that then can deal again with that, but yeah we found it easier to deal with the problems that come with dealing with a uh, model per resource. Yeah, but if you still retrain the every day, so True, but you do not always have historical data for the new resources. So basically then we get like, yeah, uh, a, a jump all the time. Okay. Yeah. Maybe your final question? Good question. So what will happen if we sold some flexible um, capacity on the markets, but once the frequency drop is there, we don't have it because we did a bad forecast or the, the customers uh, called off that they're on holiday or something. Very good question. So what happens then is that we get a fine. So uh, yeah, we need to basically pay a it depends per country, but often a multitude of the amount we received uh, for that particular hour uh, as a fine. Yeah. Does so, it happen? Hmm? Does it happen? It definitely happens. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely happens. Or sometimes it's, it's also still possible to, like an hour up front, call the TSO saying like, sorry, 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 but actually, yeah, it doesn't seem like we have it next hour. Because this is the point, right? If I can say one more thing for a few more seconds. So um, we need to, <laughs> I'm thinking like what do I want to say? So um, these, these, these frequency drops, they don't happen every hour, every day, right? They happen sometimes. So once you make a, um, a bit and you got accepted, yeah, you need to report that you actually had this capacity, but yeah, if you're not called for making a, a, a frequency um, counteract, then nobody never would actually really know if you could have acted. So we need to be truthful and we need to be, uh, yeah, honest, right? Um, and therefore, even if, yeah, we're not even certain that we will be called next hour, but we think already, oops, we made a mistake we are correcting for it and we call it TSO and we say like, okay, we need to buy buy something back basically. Although that does make us a fine, but yeah, at least we are a trustworthy party in this whole uh, market and we keep on be trusted. Thank you.
be interested. All right, that's it, I think. <laughs> same, same. And thank you all. Um, it was nice, nice audience, and thanks for all the, the nice questions. So uh, let's have a drink. <laughs> and maybe you want to say something? I don't know. <laughs> oh. Let's have a drink together. And uh, yeah, thanks again for attending. <laughs>